Yeah, perfect. Everyone got their ticket for the React Bingo? The thing that you don't understand what you need, what you need it for? Perfect. Um, so welcome to our, uh, I have lost track of how many, how many events we have already. It says number five, but it's more because we're doing a bunch of other stuff like workshops and uh, other things. Uh, we're really happy to see all the familiar faces, all the new faces. Come say hi. Uh, Okay, so this, are, this is our Twitter. Um, basically, you know what to do, take pictures. Um, I use this name. Perfect. Um, quick uh, word about Covenant Tech, uh, the company that's behind the, behind the meetup. Uh, we are a um, front consultancy. We do a lot of work with React and React Native. If you need help, come back to me. That's for you. <laughs> so, uh, this is something I forgot to mention about three minutes already. Um, um, have you heard about the Ignite Talk format or Petra Kucha format? Raise your hand if you've heard something like that. Okay, quite a few, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so basically, uh, Ignite Talk or Petra Kucha Talk is a, is a lightning talk which consists of um, about 5 to 10 uh, short slides, up to 10 seconds. And this is what we are um, trying to do with our like, uh, great sponsors. So it's all being engaging for you, it's like super cool, and we'll see it in a moment. So just um, for you to understand what's going to happen in a few moments. Oh, we have one sponsor that couldn't make it today, Fiverr, um, really great company. Uh, people want to work there, come talk to me. And we have another great sponsor, Major League Soccer. Yeah, and I'd like to invite Kurt to give an Ignite talk on that. <laughs> so, like once I hit spacebar, yeah. we have our time. Let me know when you're ready. Cool. Hey, can everyone hear me? All right, cool. So we are uh, Major League Soccer. Uh, soccer League started in 1996. Uh, if we have recently seen a ton of growth. Uh, we are huge into uh, user experience, right? Uh, specifically, we've invested a ton in, in React. Uh, React Native as well. Uh, and we're also pretty uh, big fans of uh, the entire ecosystem, right? GraphQL, uh, Webpack, uh, you know, pretty much Leading edge technologies without uh, you know cutting ourselves wide open. Uh, <clears throat> you know we love to build great user experiences. We're uh, having an upcoming React Native uh, mobile project uh, that is taking off, and uh, we're hiring. Right, so we're looking for two junior positions to fill. Uh, so this you know if uh, you have no experience, that's perfectly awesome. That's great. We're really looking for people who are like straight up juniors. Uh, if you're not comfortable coming and talking to me, just reach out to me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, you know, so if you want like a more private uh, uh, setting, if you have some questions or anything like that. Yeah, and these are great guys. Actually, it's, um, it's a pleasure to work with them. I assure you. Cool. So, um, who wants to speak at the next meetup? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, we got one speaker. Cool, so everyone who wants to speak and you, you're shy to, go, to come on stage or you don't know what to, talk of, um, to speak about, come to us, we'll help you find a topic, we help you prepare, we help you like, do dry runs, prepare your slides. It's really cool to speak at React NYC. Uh, also, uh, we need help with meetups, um, so we do a lot of stuff in the community. Um, and there are a lot of um, organizers, can you please raise your hands? All the people behind the meetups, yeah, you, you, or Zeroman, or Zeroman is out there helping, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's like, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work, and if you want to get involved in the community and help us um, create React NYC and other meetups, go to nyc.gs.org slash chat, and reach out to, to me or to Kirill or to anyone with, uh, with a green label or, uh, or a yellow label, and we'll get you inside. Um, that's it for now. Enjoy, and welcome James to stage for the first time.
sort of. Oh, this does work. Okay, cool. So, uh, welcome to uh, Meetwork.js, a uh, framework for building streaming web applications. Uh, before we get started, a little bit about myself. My name is James Nijoya. I'm a front end web developer at a company called Veltech Inc. We are a digital agency, and over the past two plus years, I've been working at Veltech. Uh, primarily, been working on enterprise level e commerce systems, primarily backed by Java and .NET. So, some pretty heavy duty stuff. About over a little over a year ago, while working at Valtech, I started working on this this framework that I've been that I've been building. And this framework was, was built out of out of the ideas that that underpin two two frameworks that were getting very popular around the time that I was I was starting to work on this. Obviously, the first one of those is React, or I wouldn't be here. Um, and the other one is is CycleJS, which maybe some of you have some familiarity with. And so I want to talk a bit about today what the philosophical underpinnings of these two frameworks are, how I put those pieces together into, into Brook.js, and, and talk a little bit about how those two pieces kind of fit together into building, uh, building this, this framework. So let's start right at React. Obviously, we all know a lot about React. React is awesome. Um, so the biggest thing that I got out of, out of learning programming with React is this idea of being able to treat our view layer as a declarative way of describing the way that the, the view should look. Um, in this case, once we got stateless components, we actually be able to turn our view layer from something that we might have to deal with transitions between states to something that we can just declare how we want the view to look. And so what this does is it turns our view layer into essentially a pure function. It turns into a pure function that takes in props and returns DOM. And so we're able to now treat our view layer as a pure function, a pure function that just takes in props and returns DOM, and pure functions as a methodology for building applications is an amazing way of building these sorts of things. Because pure functions are incredibly testable. Because we don't have to worry about setting up a lot of global state or mocking things or doing anything outside of passing arguments and checking a value, it allows us to really kind of reason about small pieces of code without having to worry about what's going on outside of that function. So now once we're able to do this with, with our view layer, we're able to do this for really the entire application as a whole. And so if you really want to make your application as resilient as possible to change, you have to write tests. I think tests are a really kind of underappreciated aspect of doing front-end web development. And so, like, if you want to prevent bugs in your code, write tests for your code. If you want to prevent regressions in your code, write tests for that code. It means you're able to then go back to that code, not only get an understanding of exactly what the developer was thinking about when they wrote it, but be able to then make changes without breaking things, breaking expectations about how it's, it's currently working. And so, this pure function, this, this method of thinking about our view layer as a pure function, kind of shifts the way that we get to think about building web applications as a whole. And so thinking in React is more than just than just building a, a kind of declarative UI, but it also means thinking about our, our web applications functionally. So that we're thinking about it as a, a, an input that returns a new output, and we're able to pull in a lot of the ideas that we would normally think about in, in a functional paradigm into the way that we build web applications. So one of the ideas that I found really interesting and really useful for, for working with, with, with web applications is treating your data as immutable. So instead of doing stuff like this where you, you know, stick Bowser into your list of admins because you had some array mutated some other part of the application, you don't know how that got there, or where things changed, or what happened, you instead make copies of your data. And you end up working with new instances so you don't you, you eliminate this kind of whole class of problems where your data gets changed and you don't know how it changed. And so once you've kind of got that idea, then we can look at, at some of these other kind of methodologies and ways of, of doing these sorts of data manipulation that functional programming brings to us. And for me, the, the building blocks for, for kind of understanding that have been map, filter, and reduce as the kind of basic, uh, basic tools that we use to kind of deal with these lists. And so we look at map as the first example. The first one we are squaring these numbers. We get a new array that says one, four, nine. If we want to remove all the numbers that are less than one, we get a new array that is uh, just two and three. And then if we reduce over it, we get a new array or a new number that's just six. And in all of these cases, we still end up with the original numbers array remaining the same. So we're able to to do all these 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 uh, 
manipulations over the list without worrying about changing the original data. And so it means that these functions are again pure, and again really easy to work with and, and testable. And so once we kind of have this idea now of, of treating everything as a pure function and treating everything as immutable, we tie that together with the architecture that Redux has kind of brought for us. Pulling the idea of making our, our data immutable and putting that data in the center of the application where it's only changeable through through passing in actions and passing it through a reducer function. The reason, again, that I highlighted reduce here is because the center of our application and the way that that state changes over time is just a reducer function. We could really think about Redux as, as a tool being, being an array that is reducing over a reducing over a state object. So passing every time a new action is passed into the store, we we return a new state based on what that action does. And again, the producer function is this really pure, testable, kind of beautiful thing. It makes it really easy to, to know exactly what is happening in your application at any time. Because you can see what actions pass through the center of the application. You can see how that, that change has caused the state to change. And so you can use that to make it really easy to reason about the data flow in your application. And so I highlight the fact that this is a reducer function and that we can think about this as like reducing over an array of actions because I want to then introduce what kind of CycleJS brings to the table. And so this picture really kind of makes me chuckle. Um, this is from a, a tutorial that Andre Spaltz, the guy behind CycleJS, wrote uh, called the introduction, uh, the introduction to React Programming that you never knew you needed. And so well, some of the concepts that I'm bringing up you want to dive into more depth, I highly recommend that tutorial. But the underpinning idea of CycleJS is that everything that happens in CycleJS works through streams. And so I'll start off by saying I actually should be using the term observables. I like the term streams because I get a lot of metaphor mileage out of it. For <laughs> calling things streams and rivers, and I use the term delta later on. That all kind of comes out of that like that like, river metaphor that I really like. Uh, but I really should use the term observables because they are working on a spec for this land in the language proper for ES observables. The other thing that I want to mention, since I got this question on the meetup before I started, is that it's different from you think of like maybe you have some experience with MobX and the observable observer pattern there, that's a little different because MobX is, is looking for, are looking to do callbacks when data has changed. Whereas this is more about adding values to, to an array or, or actions or events over time. So let's look at observables themselves. So this is from the RxJS docs uh, reads, the observable object represents a push-based collection. So obviously that's really clear to all you guys, so I don't have to talk about this anymore. <laughs> yeah, so this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Before I actually move on to the next slide, I do want to highlight real quick two terms that are, that are part of this. The first is push-based, so hold this in your mind for a second, and the second one is collection. So I'll show you an example of what we can do with an observable, and it looks fairly similar to what we can already do with callbacks. So we, we query the DOM, we get an input, and we wire up an add event listener call to input, and then we can console log as that input value changes. We can do something similar with the observable, where we use from event, and we take a, we get back an object, the observable object, that we can then subscribe to, and we get each of those event objects passed into the callback. And we're doing kind of a similar thing here, where we get a, where we get a callback call whenever a new thing happens. So it looks pretty similar, but we've actually done a pretty neat like abstraction over the, the event itself. And so what we've actually done here is we've taken the idea of this, this input from outside of our system, the DOM, and that gets input into our system, and converted it into data. We've converted it into an array whose values arrive over time. So if you go back to that original definition of a push-based collection, what it, what it really means is that it's an array that, that doesn't have all of its values in it. It gets values pushed into it as things happen. That as the DOM events occur, values get pushed in and we get to deal with them. And to turn that input from something that we have to deal with with callbacks to something that we can now deal with as if it was just data, which means that we can do all the same sort of pure functional programming stuff that I talked about early on that I thought was really interesting and apply it to things that are outside of the system. The other piece that is really kind of neat about observables is that they're self-cleaning. When you unsubscribe to an observable, that, that event listener will get removed. So they clean up after themselves. They clean up the resources that they generated as being set up. When you plug into one of these third-party sources like the DOM or like an API endpoint, it gets rid of anything that you subscribe to when it, when it terminates. And so again, we can do all of the same sort of 
data manipulation things over an observable that we could do over an array. We can map over its values and turn them into new ones. We can filter out values that we don't want. Or in this case, we turn it into a, a, like a, like a reduce function. In this case, we're using scan. The reason that we're using scan is because we want all of the intermediate values. If you were to use reduce here, you'd only get the last value after the stream terminates. But you notice that that last scan value, if we're emitting each of the intermediate values, as we go, and we are taking the last value and making changes based on the new value that has come in, this is basically redux in a line of observables. And so it gives us a lot of real, real power to deal with events over time. And JavaScript is all about dealing with events over time. So it makes for a really excellent abstraction over the process of dealing with the dealing with asynchronous programming, coordinating the asynchronicity between multiple sources. And so I think that that abstraction has been a, a kind of a really excellent way of thinking about the problems that you often deal with in JavaScript. So CycleJS then takes this idea and turns the whole application into a pure function, where you get an object that is just a collection of streams, and you return an object that's another collection of streams, and then the framework is responsible for plugging those streams into the external sources from where they come and go. And so you end up just like representing your DOM as, as an array of DOM nodes that get emitted from your streams, or you get your, your events are just streams, so all of this just becomes data manipulation. And so CycleJS fundamentally is, you know, observables pass into main, observables remove from main, it's observables all the way down. And so the idea of being able to do this, this functional programming concept of turning all of our external sources into data that we can interact with is, are the two kind of big ideas that I thought were really interesting and how could be applied in, in a new way to, to a new framework. And so the big reveal, this is really kind of the under, underlying mental model for what a Brook.js component is. It's just a function. It's a function that takes in a DOM node and takes in a stream of props and returns a stream of actions that are going to come out of it. And so we handle the rendering kind of internal to the component, but essentially this is all this is. We, we wrote a, a lot of, a lot of uh, API code in order to make building out a DOM node, building out a component a little simpler and make it easier to plug into children and, and make sure that, pet, that, that uh, props are passed around properly and all that sort of stuff. But fundamentally, this just pulls in all of this, this code and returns a function that takes an element and a stream of props and returns a stream of actions. And that stream of actions, as you see, I'm using kind of the same format that we use for a Redux component where you have uh, an object that has a type value and a payload and you use that to update your, your central state. So we just plug this stream into Redux and we plug the props back into the component and the same kind of cycle idea that CycleJS has, we end up kind of applying to, to a Brook.js component. So we have a little bit of a different approach for dealing with side effects. Again, I love the idea of observable being observables all the way down. And so what we do is I take this idea of of the, the delta. And, and the delta, again, I love the, the kind of metaphor mileage I get out of streams. A delta, if you think of like the Mississippi Delta, is where a bunch of rivers come together. And what happens is, when the rivers come together, the, river, the speed of the water slows down. And so any of the sediment and silt or whatever that has been dragged by the water to this point gets deposited. Which I thought was a really nice metaphor for side effects, right? So we've done something to them because of these pieces that come together, we've done something to the area. And so that's what the delta idea came from. But it's really, again, just a function that takes in a stream of actions from the store, and takes in a stream of state from the store, and returns a new stream of actions. And that again just gets plugged back into the Redux store, we get this whole kind of like like way of, of building out the application. And again, this is a a pure function. Essentially, we do have kind of the, the little quirky bit where we're importing the API services, but we can we can fix that by passing in those services into the function themselves. And now again, we've got kind of a nice pure way of testing these deltas to make sure that they do what we expect them to do. And for the most part, the deltas are extracted from the actual process of doing doing the doing the side effects. They just have to interact with the service that will return a stream that will do the side effect for us. And then we finally get to the point where we wire the whole thing up together. Brook.js provides a delta for wiring up your DOM. The user delta might be an API thing that you write yourself, but you get to plug the whole thing into a store and then initialize it, and you get to just write everything with streams. And this really makes for an elegant way of, of putting together the entire application. Because with your application architecture, if you guys can see this, is essentially the store sits in the middle of the application. All of the places where you might 
on side effects as you layer your API, maybe you want to save to local storage, just becomes a function that takes in actions from the application and the state from the application and emits new action back in the store. All that stuff gets kind of rebroadcast to all of the other deltas in the, in the application. And so this is, is what fundamentally the, the architecture that, that I've been building, which kind of ties back the, the store idea from Redux with the kind of strings idea from Cycle and kind of pulls the whole thing together into a really, I think, elegant and easy to reason about flow of, of data through the application. And obviously up to this point, this is something that I've basically been working on myself, but I spent a lot of time ironing out to make sure that the API, that the way that it works, is stable. So it's gotten to the point now, if we looked back at the, at the original component, there were a bunch of factory functions essentially exported by Bulk.js, which take in various configurations and return new factory functions that you can then plug into the main component. And so that factory functions are stable. In terms of passing a particular configuration, you'll always get kind of the same semantics of how those pieces work together, but we're, like, we're able to, to use that to, to build out some of the internals and, and fix things as we go without breaking user land code. I've also, again, spent a lot of time working on this by myself, so the documentation is complete from my perspective, but I haven't had a lot of third eyes yet, uh, third people, third party eyes on the documentation, so I'm sure there are typos and things that aren't clear, things that are obvious to me, but not necessarily obvious to external users. And we've got this kind of full way of building the entire application architecture kind of put together. So I'm really hoping to talk to you guys today about it because I want people to come in and play around with it. You get an opportunity to, to try it in a project, maybe build, build some application with it, do some little things with it, um, file some bugs, see if you run into problems, make it do things that it was never intended to do. The, the project is currently available on uh, our GitHub. It's valtech-nyc forward slash brook.js which has a link to the documentation. You don't have to copy down the documentation link, but at least when I get the slides posted, you can follow these links to find, find the framework. Get a chance to play around with it, read through the documentation, make sure everything makes sense to you, and if it does, you know, let me know if you have problems. You know, let me know. I'm really interested now to get sort of some of this, this external feedback about how people might actually decide to use this. So thank you for your time. Does anyone have any questions? Based on what data changes. 
And while this isn't a thing that we get implemented as part of WorkJS, what I'd like to see is the possibility of optimizing the render process to go from like, we have the previous state and the next state, and we can generate patches from those two pieces of information, but that we needed to go through the whole, I need to render out a whole virtual DOM and diff it against another virtual DOM, and then generate patches that way, because we know in advance, based on how we compile the template, that these pieces are going to change in these ways based on this data change. And so Ember does this with, with more of the key value observable stuff, so that's kind of similar to the way Vue does it with, its, with the reactivity framework. I think we can do this in a bit more of a, like a functional way where you, where you just get the two values and turn those into, into, into patches, but that's something that I would like to like start moving towards as we, as we kind of push this, this framework forward. The original uh, part of it also was that we were using a rendering library called MorphDOM, which made it really easy to just pass in HTML strings and a, and a node and get like the, the node patched to the HTML strings. So that also was, was kind of an easy part in the early stages of, of the development. So there's a couple of like, like practical reasons and I think some kind of philosophical reasons for that. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, well, thank you, Jess. Yeah, uh, thank you, James. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, yeah. Before we proceed, can I have one more thing to do? So first of all, I wanted to thank AppNexus for, uh, for this nice venue. It's really cool. And the second thing, I want you all to get your phone out, because we're going to have a cool survey. Yeah. So basically, we, we want to have uh, the best meetup in the world. And we can only do that with your help. So I prepared, I think, five questions. It only takes one minute uh, once you join. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, our first, first uh, players. Did you see Jenny's mouth? Play the music. Just uh, go ahead and check it out. 
and learn some React. Next one. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> this is easy. There are some undecided people yet. She probably don't know, open for opportunities. Yeah, ready? Okay, cool. Thanks so much. 